Perkins, Chair of the Film Animation New Media Department here at the University of Tampa. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Tony Armour, who has been a longtime friend of the program. First, as uh, an adjunct, actually, you were teaching for us at some point for yeah. producing, then we had uh, prior to that, or after that, um, as Film Commissioner of St. Peter uh, and Pinellas. And now back from Dallas as the as one of the I think you're the lead, what, what, I mean one of the leads at Talon uh, Entertainment. Yes. So yes. Um, we're pleased to have him here. I should note for those of you who do not know the uh, University of Tampa Film Animation New Media Program, we have been around in some iteration for well over twenty some years. Um, we have had student screenings at Sunscreen probably from close to the beginning. We're going on twenty years of partnership. It's crept up on me. I didn't think I was that old, quite frankly, and suddenly, here we are 20 years later. I remember being with Tony, sorting through films very early on in yeah. 2006, 2007. Um, so we're pleased to have continued this relationship throughout all the years, and, and Tony's back, and we're pleased to have him here for this uh, trio of panels. Um, tonight is going to be on film uh, fundraising the next Tuesday and the Tuesday after. Uh, you can check their social media, but we have stunts, stunts right? Stunts, yep. And, and the, then uh, a screen, what, uh, what producers want to see in a screenplay. Okay, so all three of those should be really beneficial for anybody who's like a practicing filmmaker, producer, aspiring students, and so forth. Um, these will also be video recorded and posted on uh, the Film Animation New Media so, um, Vimeo page. If you are interested in, in discovering that link, please send an email to either myself Greg Perkins, I have cards on me, I think. Um, uh, Tony or Destiny Greer, who's the administrative assistant for Film Animation New Media. You can certainly review this as well online. Um, here soon, I know we're, it's gonna be recorded by our extremely deft media coordinator, uh, T Troy Cusson. So we're happy to have Tony and Troy recording this for us. I think with, for, uh, without further ado, we're just happy to have been partnered with Sunscreen. I'm gonna let Tony take it away. You can really determine the format. And I would yeah. please kind of warm welcome for Tony. Thank you, Greg, and thanks to Destiny as well uh, for all the work in helping us promote this and, and put that out there. This is something that I always liked to do when I was film commissioner and then people that know Sunscreen Film Festival that have been over the years, you know, we're very education-oriented festival, so we're always doing educational programs, educational workshops, and like to make these free for the community, especially this particular one because this is a question that people ask all the time and that I get emailed all the time, and people will just email me their pitch decks and their screenplay is cold and say, can you help me make my movie? And it's a much bigger answer than that. And so try and educate people. And this PowerPoint that I'll go through, some of it gets really into the weeds with spreadsheets and charts and graphs. And we'll make this available for anybody that wants it so that you can download it. Um, I know Greg said they're going to put it up on their Vimeo page. We'll, we'll also put it on the Sunscreen YouTube channel. And in the, the notes under that, we'll have a Google Drive link where you can just download this PowerPoint so that you can study it at your, at your, heart's, uh, your heart's content. Um, so kind of to get started, and I'll probably grab this microphone and move around a little bit. Is that OK? Is there, okay, good. Is there, I was gonna ask if it's okay if I move around because I don't, okay, good. Okay, great. Gotcha. Okay, great. So kind of when I start these out, I wanna sort of find out who the audience is. Like what are people interested in? So how many people in the room would say that you are screenwriters or aspiring screenwriters? Okay, so quite a few then. How many are filmmakers? also who are you know, not just writing but directing and making your films. Uh, how many students do we have? Okay, we've got a handful of students, that's good. And since we're on a college campus, I'm glad some of you showed up. It makes it easy for you. You just gotta walk over from the dorms. Um, and then how many of you are just kind of have no idea about the industry and just thought this would be curious and wanted to show up and see what it was all about? Okay, good, all of those, all of those are great. And feel free, not a big deal if you are coming in late because we know traffic through Tampa is an absolute nightmare most of the time, especially if anybody had to come from uh, Pinellas County or anywhere else. So I'm just gonna kind of jump right in and get started and then we'll ask questions at the end, but you know, maybe do a little interactive questions throughout as well, so. All right, so there are really two ways that films get made, two ways that, that and I, even though I have more than two things listed there, but this is sort of for, you know, for number one, obviously. Um, if you want to get a film made, you go out there, you raise the money yourself, and you make your movie, right? That's, that's kind of the number one way, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. You can 
crowdfund it. You can just spend your own money. You just happen to have some money you want to spend making a movie. You just go make your own make your own movie. You raise money from family and friends. You're finding investors, and this is the one that people are typically going to do. They're going to think, I need to find investors who want to put their money into the most awesome movie idea ever made and, and make my make my dream come true. Uh, but grants from nonprofits are a huge way that films get made as well. Film incentives are a big part of the traditional package on why films get made, and that's why things get shot anywhere that they get shot. Distribution pre-sales, which I'll discuss a little bit more. Product placement, you can have product placement within your films. If you see any you know, quote unquote Hollywood film, anybody, if somebody is holding a, a can of Coke or a Dasani water or anything else, that is all because they've paid to have those products in there. You see a car, uh, broadcast television is notorious for this, where you know, you'll be watching whatever show you're watching and every single vehicle is the same you know, manufacturer that makes it because they've got a deal to put those in the TV shows or whatever. So there's a lot of creative ways to, to find, find a possibility of getting your movie made. So the second way and kind of the dream way is like, you are the best screenwriter that has ever lived and magically some Hollywood executive is gonna see your screenplay and say, we have to make your movie. Somebody else just options the film from you, they buy it from you and then they just go and make the movie. And this is extremely rare. It's very hard to do and unless you're embedded within the industry and you have agents and managers and reps, it's, it's a very rare thing to kind of happen in this sort of scenario. It does happen and once you're kind of within, you know, the pool of the agencies and sort of the studios in that world, yes, that's how projects get made, but for the majority of people, especially starting out, it's going to take quite a bit more than that. And so, like I have there, you know, so the, so the big question is, how do you get someone with that power to say, I will make your project to actually do it? So first, you kind of have to understand where projects come from. Established writers, so like I mentioned, if you are repped at an agency or a management company and you've had productions that have been, you know, happened in the past, um, you're an established production company that is putting content out in the world. Web series, podcasts, social media, you know, you'll be surprised where stories come from. Anything that's, you know, books and graphic novels, there are books that are coming out that before they even come out, the agencies have the books and they're reviewing those books for potential, you know, projects to get made into films. Everything's a reboot. Screenplay contests, yes, projects actually get made through screenplay competitions or websites like Inktip, and then, you know, spec scripts that somehow get into the hands of the right person and those projects get made. But for all of you that said you are screenwriters in the room, usually you're not a producer as well. And you're like, I just want someone to make my movie. I have this idea, I have this screenplay, why can't someone just create this project, just take it off my hands and, and make this thing happen? But the reality of that's, that's just not how the industry works. So the, the big thing from Hollywood, and this is, and when I say Hollywood, I'm using that as sort of a, a broad term for, from the, for the industry, right? Because not everything is based in Los Angeles or in Hollywood anymore. You know, the, the headquarters for most of the agencies and studios are still there, but so much production is taking place in Atlanta, in Louisiana, in New Mexico, in other areas, but a lot of the decision making and sort of the, you know, the broad brand of what this industry is, is Hollywood, right? And this, these are things that I've heard from people who are, you know, agents and managers and stuff. And, you know, one of the biggest things is they just don't know you. So why would anybody work with somebody that they don't know? Because they have a long list of screenwriters that they do know that they've worked with that that's where they trust for projects to come from. You know, it's kind of once you get in with that circle of trust, then that's how the projects get fed to people. And while they're always actively looking for, for new voices and new projects and new people, you know, it's hard to kind of break out of that thing. Just like if you're, you know, making short films or you're doing stuff, um, whatever it might be, you have a tendency to work with the people that you already know and that you already like and that you've already been working with because there's a shorthand there and you're not, you know, all right, we're going to bring this new person in. That, well, I don't know what it's like to work with them. I don't know what their personality is like. Any job, you know, when you're going through the interview process, why do people get hired? A lot of times it's not necessarily for your experience. It's for the person who's the management, who's doing the hiring, thinking in their head, can I stand to be with this person 40 hours a week? I have to spend a lot of time with this person. Do I want to see this person that much? And that's the same way, you know, within the, uh, within, within the industry, essentially. You know, the, it, it's a great idea, but so what is, is very big because it seems like 
everybody has a great idea. Everybody has, yeah, every single person in this room or anybody that's watching this video is going to know someone in their life or even themselves that has an amazing story, something that they've overcome, some, you know, grandparent that had this great story. Everyone has a story that's worth telling somehow cinematically. They can all be told, but why does someone want to tell that story? So, and I'm just going to use this as an example for why agencies don't accept outside submissions. If you can think about, just from a small perspective, you know, a big agency getting 100 calls a day, 36,500 script inquiry calls per year. You, you just can't manage that. You can't take that many calls and have that many meetings, read that many screenplays. And so there's, there's no way to kind of get through that. And so that's why the policy for most production companies and agencies is that no outside submissions are accepted. If you send a cold email to CAA or WME or something like that, it just gets immediately deleted. They're not going to take a look at it. One, it's a liability thing. You know, you're not repped by, by anyone. You're not being sent to them by anyone. And two, it's just, it's impossible to manage. And then even myself, on a, on a much smaller scale than that, you know, you know, first as being someone who's been a producer for 20 years, but then also being film commissioner here in, uh, you know, Pinellas County for almost nine years and then in Dallas for about a year and a half, People are just constantly, you know, sending emails with screenplays or script ideas or someone, you know, just wants to have coffee and sit down and say, hey, I just want to talk to you about the industry and I've got this great idea. What can we do? And it's part of the reason I do these types of workshops is because it's impossible for me to have eight hours of coffee meetings every single day explaining the industry and how it works and, you know, what it takes to, to get a film project made. So the big thing is how do you get the attention of someone that can get uh, get your screenplay or your idea made, right? And so there's a there's a variety of things. You know, there are some students in the room. There are people that have uh, probably been in film school or other schools. You know, uh, do you actually know how to write a screenplay? You know, have you have you taken some sort of classes or courses? Have you whether it's online through something like Stage Thirty Two, whether you're in a screenwriting program at school, whether you're in a screenwriting group that uh, you know that meets once a month or whatever it might be, and they all help each other writing uh, writing screenplay. Um, there's obviously a ton of great books out there. Uh, you know, Save the Cat is sort of the, the the industry standard. If you know that format, that screenplay format, and you watch any film ever made, they they pretty much always follow you know kind of that Save the Cat uh, story structure and format. And so you know, part of it is what are you doing every day to be a writer? And I, I heard somebody say this at one at one point in time. You know, is it, if if you're not writing every single day, are you really a writer? Or do you really want to be a writer? It's the Think of it like going to the gym or working out. If you want to exercise and make you know, whatever skill that you're working on better, you have to continually practice. Even professional writers are doing something in a, in a way in writing every single day. I realize now that as I built this PowerPoint, you know, I put the, the text on both sides of the screen just so that it would look more visually interesting, but now I have to walk back and forth every time just so I'm not standing in front of uh, what I did. So that's a mental note for the next PowerPoint that I do. I'll just put it all on one side so I don't have to move around the stage so much. Um, so, how do you, so how do you get their attention? You know, there are certain things you can do, uh, like screenplay contests. You know, screenplay contests are great, but a lot of times they don't necessarily mean anything as far as, you know, your project getting made. Some of them are just, you know, contests that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but you've got certain concepts like, like the, you know, the Motion Picture Academy with the Nichols Fellowship, things like Sundance Labs and Warner Brothers Television Writers Workshops, Film Independent Labs. There are certain you know, you say competitions, but institutes and labs that you can get into where they will really will mentor you and help you kind of take those next steps. And there's so many different ones like that that it's important to try and at least apply to and see what that process is. Inktip, Inktip is actually really interesting. You know, Inktip, if you're not familiar with it, is a website where you can just create an account and post your screenplays on this website. And Inktip is actually very good about emailing producers within the industry and say, hey, are you looking for anything? I get an email from Inktip, you know, once every couple of months and say, hey, are you looking for anything right now? You know, what do you, what do you want? And I remember a few years ago when we were producing a whole bunch of Hallmark Channel films in Pinellas County, we were trying to find Hallmark Channel film, uh, Hallmark Channel type of scripts, and we were working directly with Inktip saying, well, what do you got? Send us some things. And we're actually reviewing some screenplays, and I think one or two of those ended up getting made in some connections that were made through some people that I had, I had sent them off to. Um, Blue Cat Contest is really good, the final draft. Uh, the Blacklist, um, many people are familiar with the Blacklist. This is 
you know, it was originally started by someone in LA, I can't remember his name exactly, um, someone will correct me online, I'm sure, um, but he started this, it was basically the best unproduced screenplay each year, kind of that had gone through that, that agency world process that the WMEs and the CAAs of the world had looked through, but projects that had never got made, and then by creating the blacklist, then these screenplays started getting made, and so that's when you hear the blacklist script, that's where it comes from, is this. But they also now provide coverage and do kind of a screenplay contest as well. And then ScreenCraft is great too. I like ScreenCraft personally just for the feedback that you get and the coverage that you get on a, on a screenplay. You know, when I'll write something and I send it off to ScreenCraft for coverage, it is sent to a writer that you have no idea who this person is. It's just a number on the website of whoever it's assigned to. And they give you feedback not knowing who you are either. And so it's very impartial, third-party third professional feedback that really goes through your screenplay and tells you, you know, what is good, what is bad. It rates you on the characters and the plot, everything else. And so I like the ScreenCraft coverage a lot. I don't like the Blacklist coverage. Anytime I paid for the Blacklist coverage, it was uh, it paled in comparison to what I got from ScreenCraft. So I, I, I like ScreenCraft much better as far as coverage goes for screenplays. Come on in, grab a seat. I just started rambling on, so you haven't missed much yet. Sort of the introduction phase is still. Are you guys students? USF, great. Glad you guys made it out. All right, so this is just kind of an example of some of those screenplay contests and um, you know coverage uh, sources that I was that I was talking about. And so here's, I don't know if this analogy really works, but I've been using it for years, so I'm gonna stick with it. Um, the craft beer analogy, which is that your, your spec script, this project that you've written is kinda of like a craft beer, right? Do you, sell your, do you wanna sell your script out of the trunk of your car, or do you want it in a grocery store where people can find it? And so think of websites like The Blacklist and Inktip as sort of the grocery stores, or if you can get an agent or an agency or someone to represent your project, that's what that is. Um, Cold calling or emailing producers is kind of like selling your beer out of the trunk of your car. And so which one do you think people would prefer, you know, to, to buy your, this wonderful craft beer that you've created from? So um, that's an analogy I've been using. If nobody likes it, maybe I'll come up with something new. But that's, that's the one for now, basically. And let's say somebody does like your script. It doesn't mean that they'll actually make it. A lot of times somebody likes the story that you've told and they like the voice that you're writing in. But it's just not something that works for them. Maybe they have something that's similar. Maybe it's not the right thing for the marketplace right now. Maybe you've written a great horror script, but whoever you're talking to doesn't make horror movies. They make romantic comedies, uh, but they like your voice. So more often than not, they're gonna ask you like, well, what else you got? And so you should always have a what else you got in your back pocket. I know many of us have had projects we've worked on for many, many years, you know? Projects you've worked on for 10 years, five years, whatever it is, and this is your baby and you're trying to get this made, but if that's the only thing that you're doing and you don't have something else or what else you've got, you, you might be stuck for even longer because just because you have this one great project doesn't mean you can't have other things that you're working on at the same time. And it says example writer for family film. So I guess I should tell this example. So 2017, I'm film commissioner in St. Pete Clearwater and I attend the Cannes Film Festival every year because it is the largest film market in the world. And I'll explain a little bit more what film markets and festivals are in a, in a little bit. But for this particular uh, film market and festival, it's where you know so much business gets done. Yes, it's very fun and cool place to hang out in the south of France and all this wonderful stuff is happening. Uh, you might get to walk a red carpet and, and attend some of the red carpet films. You're not going to hang out with Leonardo DiCaprio. I never got to hang out with him. Um, but, you know, most people, most people don't. But what happens there is that there are 14,000 people all in the industry there for a week or two doing nothing but talking about the industry. And so it's a great opportunity to meet people. So I was at the Cannes Film Festival and a friend of mine who's a producer and a sales agent called me. He had just sold a film to Lionsgate through a, a division of Lionsgate, Lionsgate called Grindstone. And it was a family-friendly film called Army Dog. And he said, hey, I just had this meeting with Lionsgate. It went, went great. I had sold this film to them. And they asked me, what else do you have? They're like, we're looking for a family, another, another family-friendly film, something with marine mammals, maybe a manatee, some dolphins. And uh, Marty Poole is, uh, is the producer's name. And Marty said, I don't have anything, but I got a guy. And so he calls me up and I was like, I don't know, let's talk. So he came over to the pavilion that I had uh, in the international villages there where all the international film commissions are hanging out. And we basically just sat down and said, well, let's come up with an idea. And 
representing St. Pete Clearwater, obviously very familiar with Clearwater Marine Aquarium, what they'd done with the dolphin tail films there, and had been working with them. I was like, well, let's make up an idea for a movie. So literally on my phone, we wrote a treatment for this uh, film called Bernie the Dolphin. It's about a dolphin that gets stranded, he gets sunburnt, there's a kid who uh, is starting a little YouTube channel, and he finds a stranded dolphin with his sister, and then hijinks ensue, and yada, yada, yada. So Marty takes his pitch back to Lionsgate the next day, and they're like, great, get us a script. So they wanted to see a script off this treatment that we literally just made up and wrote on my phone. So Marty and I get back from Cannes, and we put a very, very detailed treatment together. Neither of us have time to write it, but I reach out to a teacher that I know that is part of a screenwriting group in the Tampa Bay area uh, named Terry Emerson. I said, Terry, we have this screenplay that we need to get written. We need it in 30 days because we have a deal with this if we can get this project done. So here's a detailed treatment, start writing. She would write every 10 pages, Marty and I would review every 10 pages, we got a screenplay in 30 days, Marty took another pass on it and did a, a pass over her draft and then sold that to Lionsgate and we got a domestic distribution deal. And so I'll explain how domestic distribution deal works and, and kind of how all of that sorts out. But well, we got the domestic distribution deal and then based off of that, Marty then got a worldwide distribution deal and then Terry, we had told her, look, we don't know if this project's gonna get made, so if you could write this, you know, basically for free, and if the project gets made, here's what you're gonna get paid out of the budget when it happens. And we signed a contract and put it all together, and movie got made, she got paid. They liked it so much that while we were shooting it in St. Pete Clearwater, Lionsgate asked for a sequel. We started working on the sequel script, put that together, and so we shot two films, Bernie the Dolphin 1 and 2, that shot within the St. Pete Clearwater area, all because I was in Cannes, who knew somebody, who, what else you got? And this is how that what else you got happened, basically. So, uh, proof of concepts. So a lot of people are making short films, and this is another great way to get your project out there. Shoot a short film that's a proof of concept for whatever your feature is going to be. It's going to play film festivals. It's something that people can see kind of what your idea and what your vision is going to be. So um, those are some examples. I think Whiplash is one that many people you know, know that that was a short film before it got turned into the feature. You can literally just Google short films made into feature films, and you're coming up with a long list of projects that you'll be able to see what these shorts were before they were features. And so short films are great from that perspective of you know, seeing what you can do as a filmmaker or telling a story that could be turned into something bigger. Short films are essentially business cards. These are the business cards that you create to show who you are and what you can do to try and get something else done. So find, finding a way. It's not quite Jurassic Park where life will always find a way, but film will always find a way. So, you know, if you are trying to get out there, you have to find ways to be proactive, right? listen to the feedback that people are giving you. Not every piece of feedback is gonna work, but some of it is probably gonna make a lot of sense for whatever your particular project is. Make changes based on that. Win awards, it's very simple, just go win some awards, right? I mean, everybody can just go do that, just go win awards for your stuff, everybody's award worthy. But, you know, it's a, a very shorthand way of kind of saying, put yourself out there, put your stuff out there, whether it's screenplay contests, whether it's short films, playing in film festivals, try and get some notoriety for who you are as a filmmaker, and if you win some awards, then you can call yourself an award-winning filmmaker. I like to call myself an award-winning filmmaker because I've won some random awards at festivals. I can put that in the title because it's not a lie now, right? Uh, networking, you know, meet people. You know, the biggest thing that I always tell people is like, well, how do I break into in the industry? I was like, well, who do you know in the industry? If you don't know anybody in the industry, you know, what are you going to do? Because you always end up working with people that you know. It's a very collaborative art form. You can't make a film by yourself. You can make a film by yourself, but it's going to be very limited, right? So, you know, how do you meet people? One way of doing it is obviously if you're in school, whether in USF or some of our UT students here, you are already meeting people on campus that you're in class with, that you're making short films with, that you're doing things with. Film festivals, to me, are the number one way of meeting filmmakers. So there are some great film festivals in the Tampa Bay area. Obviously, this is Sunscreen Film Festival, we're pre presenting this, but you do have, you know, Gasparilla Film Festival here, you've got the Tampa Bay Underground Film Festival, Dunedin Film Festival, um, Sunshine City Film Festival, Sarasota Film Festival, you've got Orlando Film Festival, all over the state of Florida there are film festivals. So find a way to go to these film festivals, meet other like-minded filmmakers. I can tell you every year for the 20 years we've been doing Sunscreen Film Festival, people meet and end up making projects together because of people or things that they've you know, 
inter people they've interacted with at the film festival every single year. If you don't have the money to buy passes or tickets for a film festival, volunteer. If you volunteer, you get free passes for the film festival. If you're volunteering, you get to meet all the people that are coming to the festival. So there are always ways to get it done, to kind of get out there and meet people. And you know, when you say network, you know, it doesn't mean you have to stand in a, in a room with everybody with a cocktail and like a junior high, you're afraid to go across the room and talk to someone. Um, you know, you just have to get out there and, and be collaborative and uh, find a way to meet people. Um, there are some great articles on nofilmschool.com and Movie, Mag Movie Maker Magazine about spec scripts and kind of how to get out there in that spec script world. And I'm going to move to the other side of the stage again so I can read. So I am a huge fan of people making a no-budget, zero-budget feature film. I've heard many, many times before, you know, well, I want to make my first feature film. I've got to raise a million dollars to make my first feature film. I was like, well, why? Why, why do you need a million dollars? And who is going to give you a million dollars if you've never made a feature film in your life before? Or who's going to even give you $500,000 or $250,000? Like, that's a lot of money, right? Those are cheap for making movies, but it's a lot of money when it, you know, comes time to actually get something made, and if you've never made anything, you've never gotten that distributed, and then you've never gotten that money back for an investor, why is anybody going to invest in your project? And so I always you know, tell people, go make a film for no budget. My first feature film that I made in 2004, which none of you shall ever see if I have anything to say about it, and no one in the world should ever see, um, we made for $6,000. And we had a cast, foolishly, of 80 people and extras and stunt motorcycle sequences. And it was absolutely ludicrous. But guess what? We made a feature film for $6,000. Everybody worked for free. We basically just paid for catering. It was like, who do we know and what can we use? So I had friends that were working at Ion TV Networks, which is now PAX, or used to be called PAX Television back in the day, and it was a TV studio. And so working with them, we shot on weekends and nights in this empty TV studio. We, I happen to know a guy who was in marketing for a surgeon, and he liked to do these motorcycle stunt riding groups with his buddies. And so like, hey, would you and your buddies like to be in a movie? Sure. So we re rewrote a scene so we could have a motorcycle stunt riding scene at the end of the film. They put that in the film. They just like doing it because it's, they like doing it anyways. So what do you have? What do you know? Who do you know that you can just write into a movie? And we made this terrible film. It was frankly, it was terrible. No one should see it. It's still funny. I did, I did, it's a DVD, literally have a DVD. I did pop it in and watch a little bit of it a couple months ago just to see how bad of a filmmaker I was. That was terrible. Maybe I still am. But the point is, after I made that film, people started calling me and saying, you made a feature film? Will you help me make my feature film? Oh, that was your first feature film? What are you going to do next? And that project also then turned into the Sunscreen Film Festival. This festival that has now been happening for 20 years would not exist without that film. Because after I made the film, I was like, well, how am I going to continue to meet people in the industry? How am I going to grow and do more in the industry when I don't know anyone? And I'm living in Clearwater, Florida. So I just said to a friend of mine, Derek Miner, who co-founded the festival with me, he's like, hey, do you want to start a film festival? And the two of us had worked on and made this terrible feature film. And so that was the inspiration for then starting this film festival, which has then led to this entire 20-year career that I've had of being a film commissioner in two states and the fourth largest market in the country and teaching here at UT and producing a bunch of feature films. And it all started because I made a really crappy $6,000 feature film and then just let it go from there. Now, granted, there's a lot of hard work that has been behind that over all these years as well, and you don't just stop. But if you look at IMDb, and you see somebody in IMDb, and they have 20 short film credits to their title. And then you look at somebody else who has one short film and one feature film. Which person do you want to work with? The person who's made a feature film or somebody who's made 20 short films has never made a feature in their life, if your goal is to be a feature filmmaker. So it's, it's, it's really a mentality kind of thing. And so even if you have to get together with your friends and you've got a crew of 10 people and you write a screenplay that takes place in one apartment and it doesn't leave that apartment, make your feature film, because that will lead to the next thing. And inevitably, in that world, once you've made that feature film, you've made this $10,000 feature film or whatever it is, if you can play some film festivals, you know, you can show people, all right, I want to step up to a $50,000. I want to step up to a $100,000 feature film. And it's, it goes in stages. It's very, very, very rare that somebody is just going to be handing you, you know, a million dollars to make a movie or $500,000. You've got to scale yourself up, basically. 
So when people talk about distribution for films, what does distribution actually mean? You know, you've got the studio films, you know, your Disney's and Universal's and Warner Brothers of the world who are putting films out on 2,000 to 4,000 screens. They've got, you know, big budgets, anywhere from 50 million to $250 million more nowadays. You've got your specialty studios uh, that are, you know, focus features in A24 with smaller budgets. Again, what, we're talking smaller budgets, and I'm still saying $5 million, right? This is small for a, for a feature film, but they're still, they're still big budgets. Um, a smaller number of screens, smaller markets. There, there are these awards caliber film. A24 has become its own brand. Like what other, you know, sort of production company or distribution entity out there has a brand like A24. They've been super smart about what they've done to create this brand of, of who they are and what they do. You've got truly independent feature films, which is what I've been talking about, maybe starting those super low budget, $50,000, $100,000, rarely going to get any, any kind of theatrical release, very limited marketing, no studio releases, you know, maybe you're making something that's just a, a niche um, release, Shudder for horror films, or Passion Flicks, which is Tosca Musk, which is Elon Musk's sister, who has basically, she takes romance novels and turns them into films for this uh, uh, streamer that she has called Passion Flicks. Um, she actually did a film in Clearwater a couple years ago that uh, we worked on with her. And then you've got your subscription video on demand, uh, you know, your digital content, foreign sales, AVOD. AVOD is advertising video on demand. Fast is basically the same thing as AVOD. And then streaming is kind of the primary form of distribution that everybody talks about and everybody knows now. And right now, this is, this is crazy how big AVOD, which is like Tubi and Freebie, are absolutely killing it in the independent film world. There are filmmakers who are making $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 a month on Tubi for their feature films. It's because it is advertising supported. It's the old school television has come back again. You know, broadcast television that when, I don't know how many of this people in this room are over the age of 40 years old, but when you used to sit down and you had to watch commercials, you had zero choice. If you're watching TV, you had to watch commercials. And that is how the projects got funded. Well, that is what AVOD is. And Tubi and Freebie and channels, channel, channels like that are all advertising supported. So they're gonna force you to watch commercials, but guess what? As an independent filmmaker, that's how you're gonna make money is through that commercial advertising now. And so many people have never even heard of Tubi, but that is the platform that all independent filmmakers want to be on right now, basically, because that's where the money's really coming from. And this is just a, uh, a little kind of chart show showing what sort of the different, the different you know, platforms are. TVOD, transactional VOD, SVOD, subscription VOD, FVOD, um, free VOD. You, you kind of see the theme here? on the whatever VOD kind of thing. Fast television, which is basically the same thing as AVOD, and then, um, you know, sort of a combination of subscription and free sort of stuff, depending on, on what you're doing there. Uh, Film Hub is really interesting. Film Hub is a digital distribution platform that you can basically just get your film distributed yourself. You're gonna self-distribute. So nowadays, if I was making that $6,000 feature film all over again, I'm not gonna use a sales agent or a distributor and then put it out there and then try and get them to sell my film and they're gonna take 15% and then there's a marketing fee on top of that. Like literally the cost of having the sales agent or whoever get my film out there is gonna cost more than, it, than the film cost itself. But a lot of filmmakers now are using Film Hub, you basically create an account and you upload your film and you're uploading all of the deliverable items that you have to that you, could, that you have to have for your film to get out there. And then what they do is then they push it out there to the Amazon Primes, Tubi's, and all the streamers that we just showed on that last channel, and they decide if they want to take your film or not. And if they do, and it gets up there, you get 80% of the commissions of whatever the advertising revenue or the transactional revenue, if it's on iTunes and things like that, and you're renting it for $3.99 or you're selling it for $9.99, whatever it might be, you keep 80% of that, and Film Hub gets... 20% basically, and so it's, a, it's become a really huge platform. There have been a lot of other sort of platforms like this over the years. These are called aggregators. So an aggregator is somebody who will take your film and they'll aggregate it out into the world and try and put it out there on these different platforms. Um, there was one called Distriber a few years ago that went out of business and anybody that had their stuff on there lost whatever money they had paid them because that was one of those things I think you had to pay them like $5,000 and then they would take your film and try and push it out there. Well, this is obviously a much better model because if the film is successful, then Film Hub is successful. And so 
We're not going to go through their website, and it's not anything that I've personally used because it's a fairly new platform within the last few years, and I haven't had to personally do this as far as any kind of self-distribution goes. But I know a lot of filmmakers are doing this. You can you know, find YouTube videos where people talk about exactly what they did, how they got their projects up, how much money they're making. People are very transparent and open on the use of Film Hub and what they're doing to get their projects out there. And I think this is a great solution for a lot of filmmakers making your first films to kind of get it out in the world on your own. And then it's a way to get noticed as well. When I talked about getting noticed and people finding who you are and what you're doing, there's no better way than if somebody goes to Tubi or Amazon Prime or iTunes and they see your film up there. They don't have to know, and even if they do know that you went through Film Hub, it doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is it's out there. You've created something that's out in the world, so then it's always that, well, what else you got? What do you want to do next? You made this feature film. It's doing pretty well. I liked it. You did this with a limited budget. What else do you have? What else can we help you make? And so establishing yourself, this is a way of being very proactive and establishing yourself without having to rely on sort of the, the Hollywood industry to do it for you, right? It's uh, the old quote about God helps those who help themselves. Well, help yourself by getting the project out there on your own and then trying to work your, work your way through the system and kind of grow within the industry. This is just a random chart showing in 2019, this is DVD sales, what DVD sales were. And you can see kind of, you know, what the 2.9, almost 3 million units sold all the way down to, you know, 360,000 and how much money was made in DVD sales. And then in 2022, how that, those numbers are basically cut in half. And so if you were to look at 2024, which I haven't, those numbers would be even lower. So this is a big reason why the industry has changed so much and why people are not paying as much for films as they used to and budgets have been crushed is because there's not as much money in distribution anymore because once, once a project is up on like a Netflix or something like that, you're only paying 15 or 20 bucks a month to watch as much stuff as you can possibly watch when it used to be you had to pay $20 or $15 to watch one project to buy that DVD. You could watch as much as you want once you bought it, but now you can just you know stream to your heart's content. Is all of this making sense? Am I just rambling endlessly up here? Is anybody going to sleep yet? Are we good? Okay. I should have brought a water in with me. I had them in the car and I forgot. That's all right. So how do big studio films make money, right? So I'm using kind of uh, Avatar as an example here, like an absolutely ludicrous budget on this particular film. And that's a, a, sort of a brief breakdown of kind of where the money goes and how it's made. You know, when you make a film for $460 million, you have to market it. They spend over $200 million. They probably spent way more than $200 million just marketing the film. So you're talking about, you know, $660 million just to get the film out there. Obviously, it did $2.2 billion at the box office, but you forget theaters take a percentage of that. So that doesn't all go to, to you know, to the film. The producers, theaters get some of that. China takes 75% of, of the, uh, the films that they have distributed in China. You know, how much of it's going to Disney? Who is the, you know, producing entity? Minus the cost of the film. There's your profit from the box office. And then you've got distribution costs and profit participation and all these other things. You, this, was, this was a film that literally had to make a couple of billion dollars just to break even at the box office. The more money you spend on a film, the more money you obviously have to make to break to break even, break even. So this is a lot of this are guesstimates based on, you know, sort of kind of available numbers, but, and it's kind of staggering. But, you know, when you spend that much money on a film, you've got to literally make in the billions, which is very difficult to do. I'm not going to bore everybody going through a lot of this, so I'm going to really kind of fast forward through some of these. But again, this will be available so anybody can download and kind of, you know, study this a little bit more. Uh, Stephen Follows, anybody familiar with Stephen Follows and StephenFollows.com? amazing data analyst in the UK who only does data analysis for basically the film industry. So you can find Connor, are you raising your hand or are you just saying, yes, I know Steven. Yes. Yeah. He's a good guy. Um, and so he does a lot of these amazing charts and analysis and even things like using statistical analysis is Die Hard a Christmas movie. I won't spoil it for you. One, it is. And, uh, Two, uh, go to his website and you'll be able to look up that article as well as a lot of, a lot of others. 
So how do non-studio films, how do these independent films get made? You know, what's sort of the, the process of the finance and distribution? How does it work? You know, sort of what is the, the, behind the behind the scenes of all of this? So tax credits. The first question, as a film commissioner, any human being that's making a film asks you, what are your tax credits? Like, how much money are you going to give me for free if I come to your area to make my movie, basically? And that is the world that we live in, and that is why projects go where they go. There is no reason in the world why a project shoots somewhere other than what are the tax credits, or my aunt lives there and she's giving me a million dollars to make this movie, so we're gonna shoot in her backyard. You know, those are, those are kind of the main reasons. So, you know, you can see Oklahoma has been super popular. Uh, New Mexico, Georgia, obviously, you see that Georgia peach at the end of everything that's possibly made because they are just giving away unlimited amounts of cash. Uh, Louisiana has been very good. Texas, um, where you know, part of my job as the head of production for Talent Entertainment Finance. We have some sound stages uh, called Southside Studios in Dallas that are going to be opening in November of 2024. And so, you know, we're utilizing the Texas film incentive to attract productions there. And for Texas, I broke it down a little bit more because that's where my business lies now. And so I need to, pr I need to promote that. But uh, the thing I don't like about Texas's film incentive is how it's staggered like that. It should be 20% across the board. And I've already voiced my opinion to the Texas uh, State Film Office about how they need to change that. Um, and they're talking about increasing it for this, uh, for this coming year, basically. But you get 22.5% if you shoot at Southside Studios in Dallas, the only stages in the entire state of Texas where you get that extra 2.5%. So there's my little pitch for coming to Texas and shooting at Southside in Dallas. This is, and I'm going to dig into these pre-sales and budgets and sales sheets for sales companies. This is information that is very hard to find anywhere online, and I had to do some reverse engineering with a lot of uh, sort of digging around to kind of get these numbers, and again, I'll go through them a little bit and to explain sort of how the industry works from the sales perspective, because you need to know how a film makes money in order to know how much money you have to actually make the movie. So these particular projects, you can see the budgets are pre-sales, total sales, tax credits, et cetera. Does anybody know what pre-sales are when I say pre-sales for a film? Okay, we've got one person, two people. Okay, good, so I will explain it to you. Pre-selling a film is where you're selling the film before you've actually made the film. So you're putting this film here, Dom Hemingway, together, right? So you've got this uh, sort of rom romantic comedy starring Jude Law, and you go to a sales market like Cannes, and you say to all of these international buyers around the world, hey, I have a romantic comedy starring Jude Law. How much money will you give me to distribute this in your territory? And the way that it works is there are... 50-ish international territories around the world. Uh, many of them are broken down by country. So Germany is its own territory, France's own territory, Japan is a territory, the Middle East is one territory, Benelux is a territory, which is uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, like that's one territory. So all of these individual territories have people who will specifically buy films to release those films in that territory. And the way that it works is they will say, okay, Dom Hemingway, uh, Germany, I'm going to give you $50,000 for the rights to license this film in Germany for the next seven years. And then whatever company gets that deal, they are the ones that distribute this film in Germany. And that $50,000 you got from Germany, that's it. That's all you're getting from Germany, essentially. Yes, there's a possibility of getting overages, but it is very, very rare. And so that money that they're giving you is what everybody calls an MG, minimum guarantee. So this is a minimum guaranteed amount of money that we're going to give you for your movie. And we're going to promise you that we'll give you this movie before you make it, and that's called a pre-sale. So then I, as the filmmaker, will say, I couldn't find out what the tax credit was for that particular film, uh, but I, as the filmmaker, will say, I'm going to shoot this film in... Louisiana, and I'm going to get 25% back. So I know I'm getting 25% back on this. I know I'm getting $50,000 for Germany. So you're not actually asking somebody for $5.5 million to make your movie. You are getting loans to make your movie based off of money people are going to give you later on. So tax credit is something somebody will give you a loan for. So if you're getting a $1 million tax credit, Somebody will say, great, you're getting a $1 million tax credit, I'll give you $800,000 for that tax credit. Because that person will then keep $200,000 when the deal is done, but you got $800,000 
for your movie. Same thing with the pre-sales then, you're gonna take those pre-sale contracts and there are specific companies, Three Point Capital, my company will do that now as well. Like we will finance and we will give you money based off of a pre-sale. Is this too confusing yet? I know this is very finance and business oriented, but this, this is the industry. This is the thing that you need to know in order for movies to get made. So if this scares you too much, Run, run away from the room now because we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. Um, and I know somebody had raised their hand, but let me kind of get through some more of this and we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more because I know people are gonna have questions. So this is an example for this movie, Life After Beth, and these are the sales that were made in the particular territories and ask and take and what the minimum guaranteed amount was and then who ended up distributing this particular film. So this, this sales sheet, the way that this is broken down, this is kind of standard that you'll see in the industry for sales agents. So they're literally breaking it down by country, and the ask is what they're going to ask for, but the take is what they're willing to take, what somebody will offer them. So you're going to say, is like, I want you know, $1.5 million from the U.S. for a sale for this film, but we're willing to take a million dollars. And what's the percentage of the budget that you're trying to get? So as you can see, you're trying to get a big chunk from your North American sale, but really where you end up making the bulk of your money is all of your foreign sales. Foreign sales are the most important thing for getting your project made. And you can see A24 gave a $3 million minimum guarantee for this particular film, which was double what their ask was. So they were very happy to get that. And you can see like, um, you know, Cook Media, Village Roadshow, Elevation Pictures. So the film is literally getting bought by 50 different companies around the world in order for it to get distributed. So you have to sell your film 50 times. So you sell one thing 50 different times just to get the money for it in order to get your project made. A little bit more of a spreadsheet. And as you can see, certain territories just don't pay as much as others because they're just smaller, smaller territories. It's generally Europe, North America, those are the two biggest territories. And then just depends on you know, the other territories and how they how they break down. Uh, Turkey doesn't pay crap for movies. They'll offer like 1,500 bucks. I've literally, I've literally seen them come in and offer $1,500 for a film for like 10 years in Turkey. And it's, and, but you know you're not gonna get anything else. So you're like, fine, I'll take your $1,500 for, you're gonna see an airless in Turkey or whatever it might be. Um, airlines can actually be very lucrative. For the Bernie the Dolphin films, we made a lot of money on the, on the airlines for those particular films. So those were, those were um, you know, that's a good way to add some ancillary cash to your, to your projects. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but again, this will be available for you to download and kind of take a look at and study a little bit more, but just kind of giving you some more examples of what does it look like. This is the business side. This is what people want to see. This is what sales and distribution means for feature films basically. So again, see what the ask is, what the take, we'll put the percent of the budget, the pre-sale MG in green. So that's how much money people are offering as a pre-sale in advance. So this particular film is a great pre-sale. So, you know, you're talking over $600,000 in pre-sales for this particular film with Jude Law in it and Amelia Clark. And so they know they're going to get loans based off those pre-sales to be able to get this film made. Chef, a lot of people have probably seen Chef. It did really well because basically John Favreau said, hey, all my friends that did Marvel movies, will you come be in this little movie with me? And they all said, sure. And so it had a huge bunch of huge stars in it. And so it sold its butt off essentially and made a ton of money. All right, and again, won't bore you with all that kind of stuff. So film market. So I keep talking about um, how do these films get sold? Like, where do you go to get these films get sold? And I mentioned Cannes and the Cannes Film Festival, and this is why, that this is where you go to sell your film. So the European film market takes place in conjunction with the Berlin All, which is the Berlin Film Festival in Berlin in February. Marché du Film, which in French translates into the market of film. It's about the only French I know besides Bonjour and Merci. Uh, and... That happens in Cannes in May, Toronto Filmmaker, Toronto Film Market, TIFF, which just took place, and then the American Film Market actually is not in Santa Monica anymore. This is the first year that they are taking the American Film Market to Vegas. So I'm unable to go this year. I usually go to AFM, but I'll be very curious to see how it does in, in Vegas this year. And you can kind of see at the top, there's sort of little examples. So in the corner there, that's a picture of um, the Groupius Bau in Berlin, which is a big convention center, and you've got all these you know, sales agents and international film commissions in there. The Marché du Film, the white tents up top, you see the flags, a Japanese flag and you know, some other country flags there. Don't 
quiz me on my geography because I'm not going to be able to name all of the flags. Um, but I'll, anybody that can name all those flags, I'll give them a dollar. We'll save that for the end. Take a picture now, the dollar, without Googling, I think I've got a dollar in my pocket. And that's all I can afford right now. So, uh, But th all those tents that you see there, those are international film commissions. So if you've got close to 80 film commissions from around the world that they go and they put up all these, they don't individually, but as a part of the market, they have all these tents set up. And you literally, you can go from tent to tent and be like, Hello, Germany. What kind of film incentives do you offer? I'd like to meet some filmmakers from Germany here. What do you do? You can go to the Japanese one. You can go to Film USA, which Film USA is the National Association of U.S. Film Commissions, where you can go in and then you can see, hey, what is happening in the U.S. and what film commissions are here. So last year we had, I think, 10 or 12 U.S. film commissions at Film USA. Connor has been volunteering at Film USA tent in Cannes for the last several years, so he could he could tell you a little bit more about his experiences there. Um, but this is where all of those sales agents and those people hang out and where all of the sales for film happen every single year where you're getting these deals and making things happen. Again, you can kind of, you know, take a look at this later, but this are, these are sort of the average amounts that are the give and the ask and the take for low budget films in, uh, in all the different territories. But just to give you an idea, it's just really to give you an idea of you know what some of the numbers, what some of the numbers are, and what you can expect. And the reason the, the reason those numbers are important is because you have to know what your film is worth. People always say, you know, say, well, what's the budget of your film? Well, the budget of my film is $3 million. Well, why is it $3 million? Well, it's $3 million because I have to have this, and I need to shoot this, and I have to have this camera, and we have these stunts that we got to do, and I want these special effects. The price of your film is whatever somebody is willing to pay you for it. So if Somebody's only willing to give you $100,000 to make your film, the budget of your film is $100,000. It's not $3 million. So I think it's something that filmmakers have a hard time learning because they think, well, this is the money I need to make my movie. This is what it's worth. But it's not. It's worth whatever someone wants to give you for it. So, you know, if I have an Apple and I'm selling it for $100 up here, nobody's going to buy an apple from me for $100 when you just go to the grocery store and get another apple. But if every apple in the world has been decimated by some crazy apple disease and I have the last apple left, well, then maybe I could sell it for whatever I want to sell it for. So it's very much, you know, standard supply and demand kind of thing. But again, whatever someone wants to pay you is really what your movie is worth. So your independent film, what's it going to cost you? How are you going to get made? What does it take? And this is, again, just another little bit of a breakdown on if you're making a film with a $1.5 million budget, you know, the investors are putting the money into the film. They have to get their investment back plus 15% in profit. Nobody is going to give you money without getting something back for it unless it's some sort of a grant or it's a gift, essentially. But most the, the whole point of investment is to get money back and then plus something, hence the investment aspect to it. And, which, and it's, a hard, it's one of the reasons why investors don't put money into films a lot of times, because it's very easy to lose money in films. And there are many people who, they'll invest in a film, they lose their money and be like, well, I invested in a film once and I lost my money, it was fun, but I'm, I'm not gonna do that again. And so it's very important as an independent filmmaker, if anybody is giving you money for a film, you have to do everything you can to get their money back. Because if you do, more than likely, they will invest in your next film. Sometimes they might just say, well, just take this and roll it over into your next project. I liked working with you, I like what this was. But if you lose them your money, their money, what you've also done is you've taken somebody out of the independent film finance market and it hurts the industry as a whole. So not only did it hurt you because that person's not gonna help fund your film again, you've hurt the entire industry because now you've taken a potential investor that can help support independent film away from the industry. So it's really important that if you are gonna accept money from someone, find a way to get their money back or make sure it's done in a very business savvy way and you're, you're really paying attention to, to how the industry works. And so I say all that to talk about you know, then let's say you sell $2 million, there's a $100,000 marketing fee. What that is, is a sales agent, when they take your film to Cannes and Berlin and everywhere else, well, they've got to somehow pay for themselves to get there, right? So they're traveling there, they're paying for a booth, they have all of the sales tools, and they've got flyers, and they've got posters, and they have to rent the TVs and everything to show the trailers on. So there's a cost for those sales agents to go to these festivals and sell your sell your film. They're working on 100% commission. So when they do sell their, you sell your film, they're taking their chunk out first, which rightfully so, because, you know, if you're not going to self-distribute it or if you're not going to sell it yourself and you can't do it, then you've got to pay the person who's doing it for you. So they get their commission, they get their sales fee, you give them the investors their money back, 
You get a film incentive because the investors still owe their money. So on $2 million in, film, in, in sales for your $1.5 million film, you are at break even now. So whatever you as the filmmaker got paid as the director or the writer or whatever for the film, so far that's all you've made. You Maybe you made $50,000 because you were working on this $1.5 million film. Once all the sales happen, $2 million, you don't get $2 million. Everybody else gets their money first, and then maybe you're able to get something on the end. But at this point, you've made nothing. And so that's why it's really important to make films at the right budget that will justify the sales that they're going to get because everybody wants to be able to make that profit and then move on to their next Next project, basically. Average distribution fees, again, pimping out Stephen Follows. So you can go to his, uh, his website and look at these articles and kind of see everything there and see sort of what the distribution fees for everything. Because again, everybody's taking their little chunk. The sales agent's taking a chunk. The distributor's taking a chunk. The, the theater's taking a chunk. The international distributor's taking a chunk of that. And that's why the filmmakers who are doing self-distribution and getting projects up on Tubi and, pro and things like that are making way more money than, say, somebody who might have a $5 million film that went out to the world and got theatrical distribution. Your little $100,000 film might be making you way more money than somebody who got like a proper distribution deal. More boring numbers, I know. So again, kind of the same example of what I've been talking about kind of over and over, but it's really just to illustrate where the money comes from and how projects get financed and then where it trickles down for everybody basically. We're talking about the tax credits, foreign pre-sales, domestic minimum guarantee, all of this kind of stuff. Again, take some pictures of this. I won't bore you by what, why I'm just talking on it because I do want to answer questions as we, uh, as we kind of work through all of this. More wonderful charts, so many charts. Like, yes, I can go back. Everybody take a shot. Charts look good in a spreadsheet, but then when it gets to the actual point of talking about the charts, you're kind of like, well, this is really dull. But for anybody that's watching this on the video, you can just pause the video, look at the charts, or download from the, uh, from the link. So P&A, when you talk about P&A, that's uh, prints and advertising. They still call it prints and advertising, even though you're not necessarily making prints anymore. It used to refer to having to make 35 millimeter prints that would be sent to the theaters because every time you made a 35 millimeter print, think about if you're playing on 2,000 screens, you have to make 2,000 copies of the film on 35 millimeter to get out there, so that costs something. So the cost of prints and advertising for a film always add up, and now it's really just kind of advertising, but P&A is the term that has been used for years, so it'll continue to be used. Box office numbers, what they really, and this is, uh, you know, again, great stuff from Steven on sort of breaking down where the marketing goes, how it's broken down, how much is spent on publicity and promotions. So for any of the data nerds, go to his website. He's really great at, uh, at breaking this kind of stuff down. I know I talked about networking earlier, but it's hugely important in this industry. It's just like you start learning from you, when you're a little kid. It's not what you know, it's who you know, who are the people that you meet that can kind of move things along in the industry. Film festivals, there are 12,000 film festivals around the world. It's an insane number. Most film festivals don't last past their third year, so anytime you see a festival that gets to year 20, it must be doing something, right? And, you know, the big question is, like, how do you, how do you choose? How do you know what festivals to go to? An easy thing can be, where do you live? Are there film festivals where you live? Start out going to those, because that's easy. You don't have to pay for travel and hotels and things like that. You can just show up, and you're there, volunteer, buy a ticket or passes, whatever it might be. But there are a lot of other conferences and film markets. The, all the film markets that I mentioned, again, Cannes is always my favorite. To me, that is where I've made more, I make more connections there every single year than I do the entire yes, rest of the year combined. It's just, it's concentrated all in one spot. Produced by, um, there are different writing conferences. Austin Film Festival, while it's a film festival, is very much known as a writer's conference and a screenwriter's conference. I was um, just listening to a screenplay podcast on the way here, and they were talking about Austin Film Festival. So that one is a, is a very popular one. And then, you know, basically just don't forget to keep writing. You know, you can learn all the business stuff for this, but keep writing, keep getting better at your craft and everything that you're doing there. Um, yeah, there you go. And then, oh, I forgot to take Dallas Film Commission off of the Twitter. That was supposed to be sunscreen because I used this slide before. Uh, but there you go. That's the, that's the end of that. And now I can answer some questions. Yes? Yeah, all of that is handled by the foreign distribution. Yeah, so the question, the question is the profitability... 
in future cases here, so we make sure to have it on the video so everyone can hear. Great. Yeah, the, the, the question is in regards to foreign films, because I talked a lot about foreign distribution, and so your question was, well, you've got to pay for dubbing and all these other things, like who covers that? That is covered by whoever's licensing the film. You don't have to do that yourself. And so they're, they're including that in whatever number that they're giving you. I keep saying $50,000 for Germany. So if Germany is giving you $50,000, whatever they're spending to distribute the film, you know, their goal is to make a profit. So they think they're going to make a lot more than $50,000 over the next seven years or whatever the term of their deal is. So usually all of those international territories, whoever they are, they're handling all of the dubbing and that. But you, you do have to include a subtitle file. Like when you are delivering your film, when you deliver a film to a sales agent, it's not just here's a digital file of my film. You've got to deliver you know, the copy of the film, a transcript of the film, a music cue sheet. You have to have the SRT files, which is the subtitle files of the film, because foreign territories take the transcript and those SRTs, and that's how they create their foreign subtitles for a film as well. So there's, there's a list of sometimes 25 or 30 different things that you have to deliver when you're delivering a film. So that's something to think about as the independent filmmakers that might be uploading to Film Hub. You're still going to have to have that SRT file, that, uh, you know, that transcript, because they're going to need it for closed captioning in the U.S. as well, because you have to be able to turn on captions. So all these different things, you've got to have separate mix and effect tracks from your dialogue. So in the post-production process, you know, if you're not getting a professional post house to do your post-production, you're doing all of this yourself, because you're going to release your own independent feature film, you know, make sure you know what those things are that you need to distribute. And you can easily Google that or go to Film Hub and see what those different things are as well. Did that answer your question? Great. Yes, sir. And I was going to make a reference to Phil Donahue because Phil Donahue used to run through the audience. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Phil Donahue just, just, uh, just passed away. Yes, he was the precursor to Oprah, basically. Oprah became who she was because of Phil Donahue. So kudos to Phil. How long typically does the pre-sale period last? And I ask because it said 30% of the total budget of the film. And... What if it were to take like nine months versus like two months? Do the original uh, pre-sales, will they get tired of waiting if you sold them in that first month and you're on month nine still trying to get 30 Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And mm -hmm. it, can sometimes take, it can sometimes take nine months or a year in that pre-sale process before a film gets made. But usually when you're going through that pre-sale process, like you have an actor that's going to be in your film, and that's the reason that they're buying it, right? So you've got, you know... We'll use that Dom Hemingway as an example. You've got Jude Law in your film, and your film is scheduled to shoot in March of 2025. So you've gotten from now until then to get as many pre-sales as you can, and very often a lot of films are scrambling to the very end to try and make sure that they have all the money in place. I'll get a lot of emails and calls sometimes from people I know in the industry who say, hey, we've got this film, it starts shooting in two months, we need $250,000 to close it out. We've got all the other money in place, but we need this, we've got this gap of two fifty. dollars Do you know someone, or will your company come in and fill this $250,000 gap on the film? And so since you're the last money coming into the film, you can sometimes ask for more because they need your money badly. And it's like, yes, we will come in, but we want to be first out. So even though we're the last money coming in, we want to be the first money out. And sometimes that bumps up against whatever your other in, the other investors put money in, whatever their contracts are. So it can be very complicated. That's a long answer to your question that the pre-sale process can take months and months and months sometimes. It just depends on the project. It depends on the actor that's attached to it or actors when they're scheduled to go because there are often conflicts with whatever their schedule is and, and so on. Thank you. He's going to bring a microphone back to you. The question is, um, does the director and producer and some of the people behind the scenes, do they get paid up front or do they get paid by a commission later on on sales or how does that work? Sure. Um, so it depends on the budget of the film, right? So if we're talking about, say, a $1.5 million film or whatever, it's once the, bill, once the film is fully funded and you're getting starting into production, you're getting a weekly paycheck. Or, or whatever, your, whatever your contract says, where you're going to get half at the beginning, half when the film is, or when, is over, or a quarter now, a quarter when the film is over, a quarter when post-production is done. Whatever, whatever it might be, there's a schedule of payments that you'll get that'll be in your term sheet or your contract as a, as a writer, producer, director, whatever it might be. But typically, you're not getting any money until the film is fully funded and you know that you're getting ready to go because there is no money until that point. And then as far as 
you know, when you're getting paid on the back end, once the film is done, it's made, it's in sales and distribution, most companies are gonna use an account management company. There's really two main ones. One's called Fintage and one is called Freeway. And what happens is these companies are the ones who actually distribute the funds. And so your sales agent will give all of the contracts to Freeway and the distribution companies will have freeway. And this is how SAG gets their money too because actors need to get residuals if it's a WGA project. And so then there's this one account management company and there's a waterfall of percentages on who gets paid when. So it all depends on where you are in that waterfall. Very often you're at the bottom of the waterfall. You know, all the other investors, everybody else is getting their money first. And so it's a third party company that's distributing the funds. You're not relying on sketchy producer number two to, you know, put the money back into everybody's pockets. Does that answer the question? Yeah? Okay, good. Yeah. Hi, Tony. Um, how do you make a, f uh, a film attractive to pre-sale uh, foreign territories without a bankable star? You don't usually. You don't. Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> I, it's just, yeah, that's why they're, they're buying a film. You had a question down front here, Greg. Okay. That typically without a bankable star. So when he says bankable star, that is exactly what it sounds like. It means somebody who is in your film that is a reason somebody is going to give you money for your film. So they're, they're bankable. And so that's, that's, right, that's the struggle. That's the hard part as an independent filmmaker because you're going to make your movie, but are you going to make your money back? And so much of it depends on who's in it. So that's a question, like if you just saw a movie on Netflix, you saw a theater or something, a movie in a theater or something, and you say, oh, I just saw this great movie, what are generally the questions people ask you? You know, what's the name? What's it about? Who's in it? And a lot of times, who's in it is the first question that somebody will ask you. I just saw this really cool movie the other day. Oh, yeah, who's in it? And so that's the same thing that the sales agents and the same thing that the foreign territories are asking for you. And to be honest with you, there's, there's not a magic a magic secret to this. I've sat in on sales meetings where a Chinese buyer will come in and, you know, and so I have friends that are sales agents and producers and I mentioned Marty and a lot of times when I'd be at AFM, he'd have a booth and I'd like to just sit in his booth and I would just sit there for three or four hours and just watch him do the sales and listen and learn and pick up tidbits. And so you'll have a, a buyer from China that comes in. You say, hey, I've got this great film right here. Are you interested in it? And like, oh, well, who's in it? And then they pull out IMDb Pro, and they scroll down, and they look for the star meter. Oh, number 500. Okay. They have no idea who the actor is because they're from China. They just know it's number 500 on the star meter. And so then they use that to figure out how much they're going to pay you for the film. So it's very transactional from that perspective. And from the sales process, too, can be very, very much like that as well. Like, let's say this is our sales booth. We're, we're here. We're selling our film here at the University of Tampa. You come in. I have all these different posters for the projects that I'm selling, and I'm, I'm the used car salesman saying, would you like a family-friendly film? Would you like a boxing film? Would you like an action film with a car chase in it? What, what would you like from, from our menu of films here? And sometimes somebody will walk in and be like, I'm, I'm looking for an MMA movie. Do you have anything in MMA? Yes, we have an MMA movie. What do you think about this one? Or, you know, we don't have an MMA. MMA. Should have used a different example. But we've got this great kickboxing movie, very close to MMA. It takes place in Thailand. What do you think about that? Oh, Thailand, kickboxing. So it's literally transactional sales process. You're just selling widgets. And the artistic content and the heart and soul that you've poured into this project for many years and this very personal story that you wanted to tell about your family or whatever it might be, nobody cares when it comes to the sales side of it. And that's the, you know, that's the very sad part of the industry because that's just the business side of, of the industry, essentially. I'm not trying to crush dreams today. <laughs> it just feels that way. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for such an insightful presentation. I think I learned more about film finance today than I ever did at film school, so to be honest. But well, yeah. That's good. And not, well, <laughs> I, not to insult USF's film school. It wasn't but USF, though. So it wasn't sorry. USF. Okay, good. We're not insulting any film schools today. Yeah. But, I, but, I, but I, from, you know, Greg, I'm going to say most film schools don't have courses like this where you're really delving into sort of this film finance side of stuff for the most part. I, not none that I've seen. Yeah, so which is why I'm happy to do these workshops because it really is a piece of the industry that just people you know don't know about. It's a, it's always a mystery, and so I'm happy to you know share any little bits of knowledge that I got. But go ahead, ask your question. So my question is, as independent filmmakers, how do we 
access or increase funding, especially as students or for people who are just starting out? And what's the best method to gain the most funding? Is it through crowdfunding or taking out loans or sure. through um, finding sponsors? I'm going to go back to an early slide for you because I think you guys came in a few minutes late. Um, there's a lot of slides here. Here we go. So this this one right here kind of gives you a little bit of uh, you know what are some of the different ways like you talked about crowdfunding, spending your own money, family and friends, grants. There's a lot. There are a lot of grants. There are a wide variety of grants out there for a variety of different things. So don't be afraid to apply for grants. They're competitive, but it's you know it's an option to try and find money. And one of the things I think I talked about. Were you here for my make your super low budget feature film pitch? Yes. Yes, okay. You don't need that much money, right? Make something for $100. If all you got is $100 and an apartment, find a way to make a movie just for with the three of you and that. Like, I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of that, and I'll preach that over and over again, is just find a way to make something. You've got this one project, it's a dream that you want to make, but find a way to make something first and, and climb up to that. So much of it is taking those, taking those right steps. That's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know we, did we have somebody over here in front row? No, I guess we'll jump up here. Oh, you did. Okay. Is there a slide you guys want me to leave this on while we're, while we're here? I'll just leave it on the last one. So many slides. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know, you mentioned airlines. Yes. How do you enter that market? I didn't even know that airlines can be considered an option for distribution. Yeah, there, is a, there's a, there are a couple of specific companies that just like you have the, um, the foreign territories mm -hmm. that they license specifically for airlines. So it would be a company, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, that this is the company that licenses just for airlines, and then they'll put it out on the airlines, basically. Got you. So how would you research that? Like airlines that have film um, I would I would research it as... Um, you know, airline film sales aggregator or something like that. And I think if you you can find a name, go to IMDb, and then you can find like information in IMDb Pro, I should say, as well, probably. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So, do the same rules apply for um, a full feature documentary, as what you were saying? Yeah, documentaries are interesting as well. Um, Documentaries are interesting because there, there are a lot of outlets for documentaries, but they're not typically going to be pre-sale oriented like, you know, like narrative feature films. So you're relying a lot more on grants, sponsorships, things like that, depending on what the documentary is. If you're doing an environmental documentary and you can get, you know, some sort of environmental grants or whatever it might be. There's there's a there's a wide variety of ways in documentary filmmaking. PBS is always a resource. They don't have a lot of money, but you know, PBS, if you can get some sort of pre-deal with PBS knowing that that's coming down the road, that's kind of like a pre-sale with that. Uh, so much of documentary filmmaking is um, it's a passion project for somebody who wants to put money into that story, basically, or something that they feel really strongly about, and so they want to help tell that story. So that's a lot of what documentary filmmaking is as well. And to be honest with you, narrative filmmaking can be the same thing. If there's a theme in a film that you're, that you're making, and there's somebody who's really passionate about that, and you're making a film about, you know, rescue dogs, or whatever, and there's somebody who's a big donor for supporting the Humane Society and the ASPCA, maybe they'll put money into a film about rescue dogs. Um, there's a wide variety of sources. You know, a great way to get projects made, and one of the things with the Bernie the Dolphin film, when we got the worldwide sales deal for that particular film, the person who, the company that then did the worldwide distribution had a daughter who wanted to be an actress. And so guess who played the little girl in that film? So the same thing applies then for feature films. There are many people in the community who have sons, daughters, wives, husbands, whatever they might be, that want to be in the movies. And they might have deep pockets or you know, medium deep pockets. And if you cast you know, that person in your film, that can sometimes help get financing for your film. So there are, there are a lot of ways. I've seen a number of films in this area who it's just somebody who, doctor, lawyer, whatever, they just 
my wife wants to be a, a filmmaker, so I'm going to pay for this movie to get made. It happens very frequently over the last 10 years or so. I feel like it happens at least once a year somewhere in Tampa Bay. So how actors are, you know, such an important part in getting a film made. I was just wondering if you have any information on like how how um, independent filmmakers can acqu acquire those actors. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a tough that's a tough part. Part of it could be um, you're hiring a casting director, and then this casting director is going to send your project to the agencies and you make direct offers. Actually, agencies aren't the best way to do it. The best way to do it is really go through the manager or the management company as opposed to the agency. But the first question they're always gonna ask you is, is this film fully funded? And it's always a chicken and the egg. Well, it will be fully, fun fully funded if your you know, actor wants to be in this particular film. And so, so much of it is, again, finding something that this actor wants to do for some reason. There is a project that my company is probably coming on board with. I can't say exactly yet. We're still figuring it out. But there's a, a well-known actor who's known for doing a lot of comedic roles, and somebody has written a script that is a very dramatic role that would be a great role for this person to do. And they are very attracted to it. They really want to do this because this is their chance to show that they can be a dramatic actor and they're not just this comedy actor. They're willing to sleep on their daughter's couch in the city where this is getting made because they just want to be in this film so badly. Not everything is like that. A lot of it, again, is very transactional. It's like, you got the money, I'll do it. If you don't got the money, you know, I'm not going to. Um, so it depends. So there are sometimes ways to get to those actors. That's where it goes back to when I talked about it's not who you know, it's what you know. How do you meet those people that can get you that in? And it's also, you know, why you sometimes start small and go up. And a big thing, there's, there's a lot of stunt casting that happens in films as well. So let's say you've got a $100,000 budget for your film. It's a lot of money, but sometimes it's pretty, you're, you're able to raise that. Can you get, set aside $20,000 of that just for one actor that's going to come and shoot for two days in your film? And you're going to shoot all of their scenes first so that they're in the beginning, the middle, and the end of your film, but they only shot two days in your project, you only paid them $20,000, but they're worth something for this particular particular movie. And it could be, depends on the actor and it depends on the genre. Danny Trejo, anybody know who Danny Trejo is? Like, any of you can hire Danny Trejo right now. <laughs> Not a problem to get Danny Trejo. Put him in your horror film. It makes it marketable. Horror films break all the rules. If you're making a horror film, all the rules that I just gave you, none of them apply and all of them apply at the same time. Like, it's all over the board with horror films. Like, you can do, you can do just about anything you want. But stunt casting is a big way to do it. It's why Bruce Willis, for many years, was getting paid a million dollars a day because they would just throw Bruce Willis in a film, they'd stick him on the poster, he'd shoot for one day, make a million bucks, they'd sprinkle him throughout the film, and on you go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go back here, and then I think... How much time do we have, Greg? Just in front of you. We are... Okay, great. Hi, uh, question. Um, as far as getting a, a film funded independently, um, yes. as far as having like a, a bankable actor on, say you're gonna go the traditional route of getting it funded, pitching to investors, how important are the other aspects like a pitch deck, a trailer? Uh, yeah, no, great, great question. Yeah, great question. Y yes, you want a good pitch deck, and there are a lot of options that you can find online on what a pitch deck looks like and what should be in it, but keep it simple and don't, you know, maybe that's another workshop we can do is building a pitch deck kind of thing. And I can show people bunches of examples of pitch decks. But, you know, don't put too much in there. You really want to say, you know, what is the story? What's it, you know, drill down to what it's about. Don't have a ton of text. Have great images that kind of show the, what your film is going to look like. They don't have to be from your film. A lot of people will put pitch decks together and take, you know, production stills from other films that they like that are tonally very similar uh, or using shots from, video games or whatever it might be. But pitch decks are very important because that's really what investors and people look like, look at. They're going to look at that pitch deck first. And if it's 10 slides, they're able to like, all right, they get a sense for what the film is. This looks pretty cool. And then you've got that script that's 100 pages. They're like, eh, 100 page script, 10 slide pitch deck. I'm going to look at the pitch deck. I'll get to that script eventually kind of thing. That's generally how it works. I know that's how I end up doing a lot because I have so many emails every day. And if I get something um, and if our CEO sends me a project, hey, take a look at this project that we're thinking about coming on board. And like, I look at the pitch deck first and I give him my opinions based on the pitch deck. And then we'll read the script later on and then give opinions on that later on. But the pitch deck is very important. 
And if you have some sort of rip trailer that you've shot for it or that you've pulled clips from other films to put a trailer together, you know, that's less than two minutes, those sometimes help as well. It, it seems like lately whenever I see a director or a writer, even A-listers now, um, talking about the nuts and bolts of the business, they're kind of complaining about how residuals are dying a slow death. Is that because of the end of, sl of physical media, or, or is that even a thing? Yeah, no, that's a big part of it, is because that's where a lot of the uh, residuals came from, was DVD sales. I mean, you used to be millions and millions of dollars in DVD sales, and now, again, you know, if you're just paying 15 bucks a month or whatever for a streaming service, and people can watch it over and over, and usually on streaming, and that's what the big fight was for the strikes, there are no residuals on streaming. What Netflix would always do is Netflix would pay you for a double every single time. Like, they're just paying you. This is a pretty good price for the film. You know, you're not getting low-balled. You're not making big money, but you're getting paid, you know, something pretty good for it. And so everybody would take it because it was good money, but there were no home runs. There was no chance that you're going to, like, strike it big. If this film takes off and, like, a billion people watching on Netflix, you're not getting any more money. But you got paid pretty good as it was. And so that has really crushed you know, sort of the residual business, which is why the AVOD, all the advertising on demand stuff is becoming very popular again, because as advertisers pay more, then that is, you know, where people can actually get, you know, residuals from. Um, I was wondering, I've seen that some film commissions, like in areas, will want to know that your film's going to be distributed or that it's pre-sold, you know, yes. to, to get that tax credit. And then you also want to like get loans or, or investors based on maybe the tax credit, but you also, your budget needs to be what the money you're going to get. So like, does that only seem like a paradox because I've never done it? Or like, how do you start? No, it is a compl it's a total paradox. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, well, it's, tax credits don't typically depend on the film already being sold or distributed. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's not how most film incentives around the country, around the world work. It's if you shoot and you spend the money, you get the money back. It doesn't matter if the film never gets distributed. There are plenty of films that um, you know, get made where they spend $90 million on the Batgirl film, and then Warner Brothers said, this movie sucks, we're not going to distribute it, and they just tanked it, basically, and took a write-off on it. Well, wherever they shot that, they still got the tax credit for it. It didn't matter if it was getting distributed or not, basically. So it, it, it just depends, but you know, as far as a tax credit goes, um, typically you spend the money wherever you're at, then you're going to get money back. It's really based on you know the film and what's being what's being spent, as opposed to whether it's getting distributed or not. Thank you, Tony. You want to just hand your your microphone yeah. down the front row? Less of the film side of things. I want to do episodic television, sure. and primarily focus local. Is there anything that you could suggest for? getting some local financing for local distribution here in Tampa Bay or maybe, you know, the greater Tampa Bay area or as far out as maybe Florida to, to kind of help get this thing started and, and distributed? Episodic television. Episodic television is really hard because you really need some sort of studio behind you for that, right? It's very hard. If you're going to do episodic television and you're going to find it, Sure. Uh, the way a lot of people have done it over the years is web series, you know, um, but it's hard to get, to get the funding for that. And if it's documentary, I would go back and history related. I would go back to grants, um, people in the community who support that kind of thing, nonprofit organizations who have a mission that you align with for some reason. Without knowing what the project is, it's hard to kind of make guesses. But that's always the, always the biggest question is like, where do I find the money? Where do I find the money? And there's no one answer for it. You know, it's under a million rocks and you've got to pick them all up. <laughs> That's what it boils down to, unfortunately. Yes? When making a budget that you're planning to present to investors, do you have any software recommendations or do you recommend hiring it out to somebody? Yeah, so movie magic budgeting is sort of the industry standard that everybody uses, movie magic budgeting and scheduling. Even though the scheduling has changed a little bit, there's a lot of other types of software, Gorilla and a bunch of, a bunch of different ones, or even just an Excel spreadsheet. You know, for the most part, if you're approaching investors, you just want to see what the budget is. You don't necessarily have to use a special software, but when it comes time to actually make the film, usually your line producer is going to use movie magic budgeting because that ties in with the movie magic scheduling, which is what they use to actually, 
you know, put the film, put the film together. But as long as you're able to put a budget together that makes sense, it doesn't matter what software or format you're using. You can use Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or whatever it might be. Yeah, I am uh, kind of in the place where I made a short film, ready to make the no budget feature, yeah. just moved here. Are there any recommendations or suggestions for people, places that you would kind of point people towards? I know you had got luck with that local broadcasting station, so something similar to that maybe? Yeah, well I would say too, you know, your local film commissions are resources. Uh, reach out to Tyler here or Lisa in Pinellas County and, you know, talk to them about what you're trying to make, what you're looking to do if you're looking for particular locations that you, because you're unfamiliar, because you just moved to the area. It all really all depends on what you're going to do, but the film commissions are great resources for that. They're not going to give you, they do have incentives, so there are incentives with the local film commissions. It's going to depend on what your project is and, you know, how much money you're going to spend. Um, but I would say, you know, rely on your local film commissions and just other people that you meet. Start finding out when the film festivals are. Start going to those, meeting people, see who you want to work with, figure out, you know, maybe you work with Connor sitting right next to you here. What are you guys working on? What do you want to do? Maybe Connor knows some people that can help you out. Whatever, whatever it might be. When this whole thing wraps up, talk to people in the lobby and see what people are working on. You know, take the opportunity to meet like-minded people and see how you can work together, basically. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and Film Tampa Bay is a pretty robust uh, location library yes. as well, if you're looking for that. Yeah, so the on, online location database on Film Tampa Bay and on the St. Pete Clearwater Film Commission, and there's also crew databases on both as well, so you can search on there for um, different crew positions if you're looking for crew. The no-budget feature, again, usually that's a bunch of friends getting together to make something because the crews want to get paid, and typically, especially this area, this is a very big commercial industry area, and so people that are making a living in this area are making a living on commercials, and so they want to get paid commercial rates, which are very different from independent film rates. Um, so those are, those are two different things. So that can be a local struggle when it comes to crewing up, and that's why it's important to have kind of your core group of people together who are you know, all kind of banding together to make, uh, to make projects, basically. We've got one here, then maybe one question after this. Sure. Uh, going back to the what else you got. Yeah. How many projects do we want to have in our back pocket? <laughs> How developed do we want them to be? And is there a point where it kind of seems like I'm desperately throwing stuff at the wall? Sure, sure. I mean, it's hard to say, but more than one, right? Like if you, <laughs> you know, if, if you've got a project and somebody says, ah, you know what, I, I like your writing, I really do, but this, just this project isn't for me. Well, well, you know, what else you got? And part of the question can always be too is, well, what are you looking for? Is there something particular you're looking for? And so that was the case with the Bernie the Dolphin films. I'm looking for a family-friendly marine mammal. Very specific. I don't know, you know, why family-friendly marine mammal with kids and whatever in it, but, you know, very much. And if you're just looking to make something that can get out in the world and get distributed, that's very different from like a story that you want to tell, right? So for example, um, Hallmark Christmas movies. Like how many people in here have seen a Hallmark Christmas movie? Yes, most people. Whether you want to or not, you've probably seen a Hallmark Christmas movie. But everybody loves them. Those things crush. Those have some of the best ratings and have some of the most viewership of anything. So you make a Christmas movie, you're going to get distribution for your Christmas movie in some form or way. You know, if you make it halfway decent and you want to throw it on, on Tubi. Uh, something else that's, that's really um, popular right now, and especially on Tubi, are... Um, basically black versions of Lifetime movies. So Lifetime movies that are like the women in peril type of films, like uh, my stepdaughter stole my husband or whatever, whatever it might be, but, but sort of black oriented on those. Those are very popular right now and those are killing it on Tubi. And so those are a very popular genre that's on Tubi right now. Um, I mentioned horror films, but so there are certain things that you can always make from a genre perspective uh, that are popular that can get distributed essentially. So it just really depends on if you want to, like, I just want to make something that's going to get out there that can then lead to the next thing that I want to do. One for you, one for me. I'm going to do this one for the industry, and then I'm going to do this next one for myself, whatever it might be. And so a lot of people then get into that, you know, wheel of I'm just making stuff to make a living, and I just, because I like making stuff. But whether it's Hallmark Channel movies or Lifetime movies, you know, those have a very dialed in kind of audience. Ho anything holiday related, um, you know, Always seems to do well. I know we've got to wrap up here, so. Yeah, one more, anybody? Uh, one more. Here? I don't think, have Land Lakes, have you asked one yet? I don't know your name, I just read your shirt, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let me tear the stairs down. Um, I know you mentioned that a good way to network is at these 
film festivals. And obviously we're all very passionate, but at the end of the day, what are the people that like really resonate with you and the, like those type of conversations, like what are they telling you that you really think about after that full day is gone? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I feel like after doing this for many years, my BS meter is at a very high level. Like I, <laughs> like I can really tell if somebody's full of crap or not. It's gotten, gotten to that point. There are, some, there are certain conversations, you start having a conversation with somebody, and you're like, yeah, this, this person, no. You know, they just, either they're, a, a lot of times, if, and I think this is almost anything in life, right? Like if I were to come in here and say, I'm the best volleyball player any of you have ever seen anywhere in the world, I probably suck. Um, I'm probably not very good at it. And so somebody who kind of talks about themselves too much or promotes how good they are and tries to push how good they are to sell themselves to you, I've found that that typically is a, a you know, a red flag in a lot of cases. Um, but you just kind of have to, it's hard, it's hard. Sometimes people are very good liars. Um, and that's, you know, life sometimes, but I think so much of it is not necessarily you have to think about what can this person do for me, but do I just like this person in general? Is this somebody I can hang out with? Is this somebody that I kind of like, that I could be friends with? If that's the case, then maybe you want to work with them as well. You don't maybe know what their work ethic is like or anything else, but it's, at least it's a starting point to be able to get you somewhere. And I've also found, and I try and tell people this too, is so many times I'll be at a film festival or an event and people just come right up to you and they just start pitching their story. Like you've never met them before in your life. <laughs> they just like, hey, how you doing? I'm Tony. Hey, I'm you know Jimbo or whatever. Like, hey, Jimbo. All right. And then they just start pitching the story. And really what I found the best way to approach things is don't come up to somebody and ask them what they can do for you. So what can I, what can I do for you instead of what can you do for me? What can you do for me? Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes. You know, you know what I'm trying to say. Don't be, don't be selfish. So much of it. And I'll give one example, and I know we've got to wrap this up. Um, Sunscreen Film Festival, this is probably back one of our early festivals, maybe 2008 or 2009, something like that. We had a uh, girl who was going to St. Pete College, and she was an aspiring filmmaker, and she saw a film at the festival that she really loved. I think the name of the film was Pretty Ugly People, and she went up to the, the director afterward and said, I really loved your film. I, you know, I'd love to work with you sometime. What can, I, what can I do for you? And he was like, well, you know, if you ever you know, get out to L.A., look me up. So she went out to L.A. a year later, whatever it might be, or moved out there. She had had his contact information. She went to coffee with him and just was like, well, what do you need? What can I help you with? Started volunteering, helping him out as a PI on, PA on sets. Oh, it turns out this guy ends up being a producer on The Dark Knight and um, makes the film The Help that won these Oscars. And so she starts working on those films, becomes a producer on the Amazon series Transparent, and now has translated this into a long career as a producer in the industry because she said, what can I do for you? And offered to help rather than what can you do for me? So just one small example, like I'm all your dads today, basically. Um, but, uh, but I think it makes sense. You guys probably get that. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for everything. All right, thank you. Um, Folks, remember to sign up for...